As we go into this study here tonight, I, I put a title on this study, Do I Have Your Attention? Now, while that sounds really great in light of what I just said, it absolutely has nothing to do with me or that story. I'm just drawing you in, in, in to understand the, the, the focus of what we're going to look at here tonight. It's coming from that vantage point of, do I have your attention? And so, if, if you remember back with me last week, perhaps you were here in the seats, perhaps it was you were watching online, or perhaps you're trailing along on the radio as this broadcast on the radio here. Um, you know, last week we finished up chapter 7, and in chapter 7 we saw, saw all kinds of stuff in chapter 7. We saw a scene on earth, we saw a scene in heaven, you know, and, and, and we learned that that parenthetical, that chapter 7 was a parenthetical, is one of those chapters that took us deeper. We got greater information behind the scenes as, as to all the stuff that was going on. Uh, you know, around that, that chapter six time where the seals were being opened. And so we, we got a greater glimpse into the details of world history uh, or, or the future world, if you will, and, and, and all that will take place in this prophecy here. And so, um, but let me say this, that if we were here in chapter six and we're reading straight through in chapter six, we come down to the, 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 the end of the verse there, uh, my Bible ends in verse number 17. It says, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? It ended with a question. You remember last week we answered that question, who was able to stand? And we identified the 144 that will, that will be protected on earth from God. And we also identified the tribulation saints, those that will be martyred for their faith, that they were standing before the throne of God. And no longer would they have to endure the pain and the suffering that they went through. And so we, we answered that question with two people that were able to stand, only two. But if we were to read chapter, if we were to read straight through, we'd stop at the end of chapter six and we would pick up in chapter eight, verse one. Okay, that's kind of the flow of it. Again, chapter seven was that parenthetical. It, it, it's where it gave that deeper information as to what was going on behind the scenes in chapter six. And so let me, let me set the story, let me set the scene, let me, let me set the parameters as to what we're gonna see here in chapter eight. Uh, in, in, in chapter 8, you know, we find that at this point we enter into that overlapping period, but we're, we're, we're in that last three and a half year period of the tribulation, okay? So we're, we're, we're overlapping a little bit, but we're, we're right there going into that, that second three and a half year period of time. By way of reminder, we know that the tribulation is broken up into a seven year period of time. It's that 70th week of Daniel where God is working with Israel during the course of this. And it just so happens that it's all during the tribulation period. Second thing I wanna make sure that we note here before we go into this chapter, and that is that these judgments that we're going to take a look at here tonight, we're only gonna get through four of them. But as we look at these judgments, these are literal judgments. These are not symbolic in any capacity. This is a literal judgment. These are literal things that were happening. Just like when we were in chapter six, and we saw you know, what, is, what is termed the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and we realize that you know, the, uh, the white horse, political religious leader trying to get peace in that way, and we saw what happened you know, that followed that, that there was war and bloodshed that was coming from the red horse, and then we saw the black horse, which represents death, okay? And then the pale horse um, that, that brought, uh, actually, uh, let me rephrase that. It was, I think it was the pale horse, then the black horse. However it was on there, I should look in the Bible. I have one right here. Point being is, is that it was death followed by, it was, it was uh, starving followed by the death aspect there. And so we, we, we saw that those were very natural things that, were, that will play out upon the, the face of the earth here. So too in chapter eight, these are very real literal things. They're not symbolic. This is, this is not hyperbole as we read through this, and, and, and we'll go through the interpretation here together, and we'll look at it, and it'll be very easy. Um, and so, so, so also uh, mark this down, and I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but I'll do it here, and that is, is that seal judgments, trumpet judgments, bowl judgments, these are just titles that are put upon the type of judgments that God is unleashing, okay? So don't get so caught up in, in the actual term of seal, trumpet, or bowl, okay? It's not like there's this miraculous thing that is sitting behind that. So don't, don't go there in that and, and, and clutter your mind with something that you don't need to. We want to understand the basics of what we're looking through. We want to be able to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ as we move through this. But, but don't confuse yourself. Just understand that, the, uh, that as the seal judgments go, and then boom, it hits, and the trumpet judgments go, and then boom, it hits the bowl judgments, okay? So we're seeing a shifting, a moving through that seven-year period of tribulation time, uh, and, and, and you know the last three and a half years of that is the great tribulation because of the ramping up of what takes place with the bold judgments, uh, and, even, and even starting on these trumpet judgments, we'll see that too. And so 
I also need to make sure that I say this. While these are very real and very literal, these things are, are you know, again, they're not running parallel to each other. They're, they're running behind each other. Uh, but these judgments are not because of global warming, okay? You will hear people, hear people out there teaching, well, this is because of, of global warming or it's because of a nuclear war that's going to happen. That's not what these judgments are. How do I know that? How do you know that, Jeff? Because as you and I read chapter eight, we see that it's coming from the hand of God, that God tells the angels to do X, Y, and Z. And these are the things that we open up here tonight. So again, it's not global warming. It's not a nuclear war. This is, these are supernatural judgments of God and, and they're falling upon the earth. And what is it designed to do? Here it is. We're right back to the title. They are designed to get the attention of a rebellious world. To get the attention. Why? Because God doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. The scriptures tell us that. That, that, that even as we go all the way back to, to the time of the flood with Noah, we know that God desires grace before wrath. That's what he desires. And even during the tribulation period, you know, the, uh, uh, generically tribulation period, whole seven years, uh, three and a half midway point and on to the end, that's the great tribulation, the ramping up with these judgments, that God still desires to show grace before wrath. He's doing everything he can to get the attention. And this, everything that we're gonna see to, tonight, it is designed to get the attention of real people. So go like this to yourself, okay? If you got fingers, if you got hands, I'm hoping most of you do or all of you do, touch yourself, okay? You're a real person. Does God have your attention tonight? I hope so. I hope so, because I want you to learn what these, what these things are all about so that, so that you don't have to walk around and be confused about the book of Revelation. Simple. It's simple. The Spirit of God opens our eyes of our understanding. We break it down, and we can move through this very simplistically uh, as, as we go through that. And so here's what our text says. Take a look. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to mostly be in NLT tonight, uh, and they may put the verses on the screen. I don't know how many they got there to put on the screen, but... Uh, long story short, I'm reading out of NLT tonight. So Revelation 8, verse number 1, NLT, it says this. It says, when the lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. So what do we see here? We, we are, we are, we're wrapping up with those seal judgments, okay? Uh, and we see that when that seventh seal judgment was broken open, okay, this starts the progression to move into the next set of judgments, which are the trumpets. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, primarily tonight. And so when Jesus opens up this seal, what happens? Well, there's complete silence in heaven for 30 minutes. That's what verse number one says. It, you know, it's that proverbial calm before the great storm that happens, right? You know, the, 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 oh man, it's such a beautiful afternoon. And then you get, you know, an hour later, it's like, oh, where did all this... Where did all this hail and, and rain and wind come from and all that? So we're seeing this calm before a crazy storm um, that breaks free. And this particular storm, this particular judgment, listen, all of heaven is holding their breath. They're standing in silence for like, you know, so, so imagine if we all did this in our chairs. We all just stood up in our chair and we just put our hands out like this and we went like that for 30, for 30 minutes. We just stood there. I, I, can't, I can't really fathom standing there in 30 minutes. But the angels in all of heaven stood silent for 30 minutes because of what was coming. So, so, so the devastating blow of these things, these trumpet judgments as they unfold and the, and the bold judgments behind that, they, the, the magnitude of them is so awesome, it is ridiculous why somebody wouldn't repent other than the fact that they just hate God to the core. And those, those types of people are alive today. They just hate God to the core. Remember, we, we, we've learned, and we saw on our Sunday study here, uh, I don't remember if it was this past week or the week before, but that the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 3, first couple of verses there at the start of it, that not all men believe, not all men have faith. There are literally hostile people to the gospel and, and people that will never repent. And we want to be able to, to have the Holy Spirit to be able to discern this, the difference scripturally speaking, so that we know who to minister to and who not to minister to. Because Jesus said, don't cast your pearl before swine. Don't waste your time ministering to somebody that's not going to turn. And, and, and you can already see that. Those people that blaspheme, those people that, that, that um, um, you know, the mockers and the, and the people that just, oh, they just move in the wrong direction. Don't waste your time on ministering in that capacity. We are in the last hour right now, folks, of world history. 
You know, when, as we bring Jesus to the table in our lives and through our, our, the way we live, and, 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 and even as we come to Sunday morning and we share the gospel message and all that stuff, we're in America. You know, I, I don't know that there's anybody in America that has never heard of Jesus, and, and, and if you find somebody that is a mocker in that condition, well, we need to ask God, God, what do you want me to do in this? Do you want me to continue to move forward? Long story short, all of heaven they're waiting, they're holding their breath for these epic judgments that are about to fall. Verse number two, one more time, he says, he says, I, I saw the seven angels who stand before God and they, and they were given seven trumpets. Okay, so the opening of that seal, right? It closes out um, the, the first seven seal judgments and the transition there, the seventh seal had the, the next series of seven judgments. The next series of seven ju judgments are called trumpet judgments. This is what we're moving into. Uh, and, 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 and pay attention to this, okay? I've already told you that these things are not man-made. This is not a nuclear thing. This is not anything like that. This is, this is coming from God. And, and, and these angels are giving this. And so, uh, next progression. Here's a few things that we can understand about this. And, and pay attention right here, okay? So that you can see how easy this flows. In the Old Testament, we can go all the way back to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 10. Okay, the people have just come out, uh, the Israelites, God's people, he just drew them out of Egypt, and, and now they're in the wilderness, but he's teaching them, okay? And the book of Numbers takes place about a year and a half to two years after the actual Exodus, okay? So God brought them away, he had to toughen them up a little bit, Exodus tells us that he had to toughen them up a little bit, because they couldn't go the short way from where they were at and kind of, whoop, pop into Canaan. God had to take them the long way, Why? So that, so that when they saw war and conquest and all these different things, they didn't get shaky at the knees and go back. Uh, Exodus tells us that. And, and so now, again, we're about a year and a half to two years into the Exodus, and, and, and we have trumpets used in three different ways here. Numbers 10, verses 1 to 10. The trumpets were used in three ways. The first way is, is that verses 1 to 8, it would call the people together. So, so they would make a particular noise with the trumpet, and that would be the rallying call for people to come together. Second way that the trumpets were used in verse number nine, and that was, it was announcing war. So it'd be a different tone to however they blew that trumpet or the, you know, the blast on it, whatever they did. And, and that way would be for announcing war, okay? It's a call to arms, if you will. And then the third way in verse number 10 is that they were used for special times of, of feasting or, or times of celebration, anything like that. Okay, so that is a few ways in the Old Testament that the trumpets are used. What's the point? Well, the point behind this whole thing is to get the attention of the people. These judgments are the same thing, okay? As these, these things are called trumpet judgments, okay? These judgments, as they spill out, there's not an audible sound, okay, that, that, that the people are hearing other than the crashes of thunder and lightning, okay? But they're not hearing a physical trumpet in this, but these things are still designed to get the attention of people, Take a look at verse three to five now. Okay, now he says, then another angel with, with uh, gold incense, with a gold incense burner came and he stood at the altar and a grain amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Verse five, then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and he threw it down upon the earth. And here it is, probably the only sound we're gonna hear. Uh, it says, and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. So this is it. This is the opening and the beginning of what's taking place here with these next seals, or excuse me, with these, with these new trumpet judges, not the next seals, seals are closed off. And so in the Old Testament, we have Aaron, the high priest, uh, what would he do? Well, twice a day at the tabernacle, both morning and evening, he was to offer the incense. He was to make sure that, that he was bringing this before the Lord and that incense would be offered in the morning and at evening. Exodus chapter 30, verses 7 to 9, you can kind of take a look at that and, and see those things for yourself. If we spring forward from, from what that early practice was into the New Testament, we covered it not too long ago, but in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, uh, I'll read from the NLT, it says, bowls full of incense are the prayers of the saints. 
Okay, so we see what the priests used to do in the Old Testament. We see even here in, in this particular book in the New Testament that, that, the, that, that the incense were the prayers of the saints as they would go up before the Lord. And even farther, that King David himself in the book of Psalms, Psalm 141, verse number two, that David said this. He said, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And so let my prayer be set for you as incense. Remember, it is a sweet aroma. It's something that God delights in. God delights to hear your voice. God delights it when we come before his throne in prayer. And now we expect sometimes for our prayers to get answered very rapidly. And, and, and it's like, well, when they're not answered very rapidly, it's like we kind of lose heart. We should remember that, that while these are the prayers of the saints that are being taken and being brought before the Lord, we should also consider and understand what Jesus spoke in the New Testament about prayer. Matthew chapter seven is a great place to remember that because what he tells us in Matthew seven and seven is, is that we are to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. The whole thing that he shares with us is about the perseverance of prayers. Now think about that. Think about that from the context of the tribulation saints that we've already talked about, that we've already seen, that as their voices were, were crying up from underneath the altar, as we know that they will stand before the Lord in some capacity. But the suffering that they went through on the earth, that they even had prayers that were crying out to God, God, do something about this. All these things that are going on on the face of the earth, that this, man, this is intolerable. Lord, how can you look upon this and not act? And now it is a time where God is acting. Remember what he said. Remember what Jesus has told us, that vengeance is his and he will repay we're not to take vengeance into our own hands, that, that God will take vengeance, that God will make people repay. And these trumpet judgments and, and the uptick in what's happening with them is massive. Now, we move to verse number six here. Verse number six tells us this. Again, here's the transition, okay? So catch the transition. It says, then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow the mighty blast. Okay, so stop right there. As we move forward, here it is. Notice who's doing this. It's an angel that is doing it, okay? So God has, has rallied them up. He's told them X, Y, and Z. Jesus opened the seventh seal. Okay, now Jesus is telling, okay, here it is. These angels were given this, and, and now we find that the first angel, here he is, the first angel, he's, he's, gonna, uh, he's gonna prepare to open something here, okay? So number seven, take a look at it. Here it is, the very first angel, he's opening this. Verse seven, uh, the first angel blew his trumpet, and hell and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire, one third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. So this is the first trumpet judgment that is being opened. And, and what is it destroying? Well, you, you read it just like I did. We should understand that it's, it's destroying the vegetation on the land. And so these trumpet judgments, again, they are catastrophes that are given by God and they're destroying a large portions of the earth. And, and this is, I don't know, I think this is, is, is something that uh, we need to pay attention to, okay? One more time, just pay attention to it. Know your Bible. As you read it, you can find the context and you can see the movement of the chapter. This is not because of some, again, it's not a nuclear fallout that we're looking at that it is burning up all these things. I mean, that sounds really glamorous and you can put a lot of hype on that. And, you know, as someone once said, man, you could preach that because that's sensational, right? Oh, you, and bombs were bursting in air and the nuclear fallout was happening. You should have saw this guy's eyeballs melt in his eye socket right? because it's a nuclear thing. Well, maybe, but that's not what we're talking about here. It's not what this is. What this is saying is, is that this is coming at the hands of the Lord and, and, and it's not a nuclear fallout. It's not through human instruments that this is being done. This is at the hands of angels that this is happening. And so, so what do we know about these particular things? Let me give you a high level of this, okay? Because we're only gonna cover four of the trumpets. But what we should know about this is that the first one, it covers vegetation. And I'll, and I'll open them up a little bit as we go. I'll, so I'll remind you. But this first one, it takes care of the vegetation on the earth. The second one, it, it deals with the oceans, the third one, it's, fresh, it's a fresh, all the fresh water sources, the streams and, and everything. And then the fourth one deals with atmosphere, okay? The sun, the moon, the stars, okay? The, the, the lights in the sky, if you will. It deals with all that. And so as this first angel blows the trumpet, 
what's taking place? Well, hell and fire from the sky are coming down. This is part of the judgment. And, and it says that it's mixed with blood or, or, or better rendition of that, it causes blood, okay? Many of the translations say that it's mixed with blood. A, a literal idea on that would be is that it causes blood. So the hell and the fire that's coming down from the, from the sky, it causes blood. Now, when we consider it in that capacity, we can say that we've seen this before. Because all the way back in Exodus chapter 9, we find that all these different plagues were taking place. That is, as uh, Pharaoh resisted what God was telling Moses, right? Moses was God's agent to lead and to minister to the people and all that stuff. And he would go forward and he would tell Pharaoh, hey, God says, let my people go. And, and, and Pharaoh was playing games. Well, let them go a little bit and well, no, come back. I'm not gonna let all of you go. And he kept bouncing around back and forth. Point being, very simple is this. In Exodus chapter nine, verses 22 through 25, we see, maybe, maybe I'll read it to you. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven that there may be hell in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his hand and his rod towards heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it came to be a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt and all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Nothing more than I want you to capture your attention with is that we've seen this before in the Old Testament scriptures. We've seen that God has used this type of measure to get the attention of man. That's all that he wants to do. And that's what he wants to do right here in this first trumpet judgment. He's just trying to get the attention of man. And so, again, just notice that comparison there, if you will. You know, those different plagues that follow around those early chapters of Exodus, and we see these, these judgments falling here. They're falling on people that are rejecting God. God's doing everything he can to turn the attention, and they're not turning. Uh, if we were to consider that a little bit farther, Exodus 5 and 2, Pharaoh said this. He says, hey, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? That's what, that's what Pharaoh said. And that's the same type of attitude that is on the earth during the time of the tribulation. That, that, that we're not talking about the 144,000 Jews, okay, or, or, or Israel. They have recommitted their heart to the Lord, okay? They're sealed, they're protected, they're ministering abroad for sure. But the vast majority of the world is in this place of, well, who is Jesus that I should obey his voice? Who is he? That's the attitude on the earth, okay? And so, uh, again, what does this thing do? Well, it destroys the global vegetation right there from the hailstorm. Verse 8 and 9, take a look. Now we're, we're migrating down to that second trumpet, okay? Here's what it says. Then the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One-third of the water in the sea became blood. One-third of all things living in the sea died, and one-third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. Okay, so we go from the vegetation and move our way to the oceans. And the aspect that comes from the ocean uh, in this one, again, a third becomes blood, a third of the sea creatures die, and a third of the ships are destroyed. Very interesting thing to note this is that the U.S. Commerce Department says that there's more than 25,000 merchant ships on the ocean, on the open seas, in the high seas, uh, at any given time, okay? So, so what would that mean? I'm not a math guy. Maybe you can do the math a little bit better than what I can, especially in a fast capacity. But you're looking at somewhere about 8,000 ships instantly being destroyed just like that on the high seas or on the open seas, okay? Along with, you know, the, the water turning into uh, blood along with the sea creatures that are dying, right? So when we start thinking about it that way and we go, wait a minute, you know, I also remember that, you know, during the Exodus, when God was bringing the plagues upon the land, oh man, he also did the same thing with blood. He also killed the fish in, this, in, in all of that stuff. So you're understanding what God is doing. God is using his hand in a very natural and a real way that is affecting supernaturally, that is, that is bringing the judgment up, uh, uh, upon the land on the things that God provides to a God-rejecting world. Now that thought just kind of blows my mind. So maybe I need to back up and unpackage that a little bit. Okay, we're in the tribulation period. God wants to get the attention of people that are on earth. He, he doesn't take any pleasure in a man dying. 
But the things that have been provided on the earth, whether it's the vegetation of the land, whether it's the fish from the sea, whether it's the merchants on the high sea, whatever it is, all of that has been provided for by God. When God begins to pull back or to shake things up a little bit on what his provisions are, what we find in Revelation chapter 16 that men begin to curse God the same way that Pharaoh did. Who is God that I should listen to his voice? So we see what God is dealing with. He's dealing with the hard hearts of human beings. And as we look around the sanctuary here tonight with us, as we look around maybe our Christian friends, as we, maybe we look around the, the, the big C church, right? The, the church globally and all that. Maybe we can understand it from a different capacity of when the word warns us that in the last days of what's gonna take place within the church, that there's gonna be this weak watering down. That, that, that all of a sudden Christians are gonna have this sloppy relationship with the Lord and, and, and not really be on fire for Jesus. So this shaking that we're in right now, there's a global pandemic that is, uh, is bound us. Whether it's been hyped up or it hasn't been hyped up, I don't know, I don't care. All I know is that Jesus is doing great things and through the course of this last six months, my faith in God has changed. The God has mined out of me many, many things, including a high level of frustration, including anger, because I can't control something, okay? I like to control, I'm a type A, if you didn't know that. I talk fast, I move fast, I do everything fast. That's just me. I like being me. You may not like me being me, but I like being me. It's okay. You like being you, so. Anyways, what's the point behind all that? God is dealing with man. God wants to do something that turns the heart of man back towards himself because he's a good, good father. We sing about that, right? I mean, that's a song, but it's real. He's a good, good father. Now, verses 10 to 11, take a look at this, okay? Now we're, we're, we're migrating here, okay? So we, we saw the first angel, okay, dealing with the vegetation. We see the second angel dealing with the ocean. Now the third angel here, okay, these are the trumpet judgments. The third one says, uh, then the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness. It made one third of the water bitter and many people died from drinking the bitter water. So this third angel, this third trumpet, okay? Fresh water is destroyed. And this, this you know, scholars tell us, uh, you know, in the, the um, you know, in the Greek here that we're reading from, as we start talking about this star, the real word is asteroid, okay? That's it's where we get our asteroid from. I know it's written in the English here, this great star, but it's really where we get our asteroid from. So if you can just imagine an asteroid falling in such a capacity, a massive asteroid, and, and, and it pollutes all the fresh water. All the fresh water becomes bitter, okay? Now, this too is something that we have seen before, all the way back in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, we know this, that, that God was doing some amazing thing with the children of Israel. <clears throat> he started with the Passover to bring them out of Egypt. And then along the way, he opened up the Red Sea. And now we get into chapter 15 of Exodus. We see that, uh, uh, that Moses' sister, Miriam, that she, she, and she made this song and this dance thing. And all of Israel was all excited. And, and they're marching out. And we get down to verse 22, Exodus 15 and 22. It says that, that Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and then they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and they found no water. Now, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And so Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. It's so, it's so crazy what that word is. He tested them. In the Hebrew, it means to try by smell. God's given the people a sniff test. <laughs> is this going to pass mustard here? You know, what's going on, you know? And so, 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 so capture the picture behind all of this, okay? It's a very simple thing. We know that this judgment is, is being fallen down on earth from this the third angel, this meteor, this great star falls down. It affects all of the, the fresh water, okay? And a lot of people were dying because the drinking water was bitter. Understand this. Again, we have seen these types of crazy things happen in the Old Testament, specifically bitter water, I guess, is what I'm pointing to. But the interesting thing is what cured the bitter water here in Exodus 15 in this, 
area that they were calling Mara. They named Mara, M-A-R-A-H. What cured that was a piece of wood. Now, who hung on a piece of wood in the New Testament? Jesus was put upon a tree. What cures all the bitterness within our life? What is the cure for, the, for, for this, this third trumpet judgment falling and creating bitter water across the face of the earth? It's Jesus, folks. It, it's Jesus. He, he was the cure yesterday, today, and forever. He's the cure. Jesus never changes. And, and, and the interesting part, um, did my mic just die? No, didn't it cut out for a second there? It did. We had to test this. I think my cord is becoming uh, a little bit, um, what do you call that? You know what I'm thinking. There it is, tweak, but uh, there's a short in it. That's it. That's the word I'm looking for. Good word, Doug. Thank you. Anyways, I'm sorry. It did it again. So it must be the way I'm moving my brain more, or my neck. I'm going to keep going though. So, so all of this stuff with the bit of water. I, I mean, is this... Um, I always move fast, but I'm, I'm hoping that I'm moving in such a way as to at least connecting the dots so that you can see that it's God's hand doing something on earth to get the attention of people. That's all I want you to understand, that God is doing something on earth with his hand, it's the angels, and he's moving things around to capture the attention of the people. Yes, it is a tribulation period. Yes, they are Jesuits. Yes, 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 and amen to all of that but he's doing it because he wants people to repent. Otherwise, he could destroy everything in one final thing. We wouldn't have to go through all these things. We wouldn't have to go through all of the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. One judgment done. It's over. But that's not how God has did it. God has designed it, and this prophecy is shared with us so that as we look into the future, we can know with great hope, remember who these Christians are, AD 95, when, when the apostle John elder in age, when he, when he received this vision on the island of Patmos, the book of Revelation, that he was ministering to the Christian body, the Christian church across the land because they were under that great persecution of Rome. People were losing their lives and all of this stuff was happening. And all he's doing is giving perspective in the painful things that are going on, so much of a, of a perspective that he reveals to the end times, the times that you and I are living in right now, of what is going to take place in that great tribulation period once the church is snatched up off of the world. He shares all these details. And these things can be a comforted thing for us because we know that, number one, that God is going to give vengeance. He's going to repay. Number two, that the heart of God, even in vengeance, is still he desires to, to, to show his grace and his mercy before he pours out his wrath. And he, he's, such a, he's such an awesome God because he's just doing it a little bit at a time, shaking a little bit at a time. Yes, it's a great magnitude. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to downplay what, he, what the Lord is up to at this time, but he's doing it in such a way as to get the attention of people. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up if it does make sense. Okay, great. Most of you are with me. Like 95% of the room was with me. Amazing. I like that. Okay. Number four, here we go. Verse 12 to 13, and this kind of brings us down on the wrap here, okay? Now, here's what it says. Did it? It did it, did it. it, did it. Is it uh, uh, I'm messing with you online mostly because that's just me, <laughs> but it is doing it. Okay, we'll have to get that fixed. I think the next time you guys see me, this puppy will be fixed. I don't know how. Probably a different one would be a great idea. So, there you have it. Uh, and if it cuts out again, just because it's an annoyance to me, I'm just going to keep talking super loud. Uh, but you may have to interview. No, I don't want that. I, I'm not a handheld. Oh, goodness gracious. Bring it here, I guess. That makes me sad in my heart. I have to use a handheld. Oh, let's hear it for Justin. Yay, Justin. <laughs> Is it turned on? No, it'll, it'll interrupt yours if you turn it on. So oh. Oh. The reason this is going to be miserable is because I'm a hand talker. And if I talk with my... I can't hear me. <laughs> okay. I got to be a little bit more contained. I don't like that. Okay. Uh, verse number 12. One more time. I don't think we did it. We'll do it one more time. It says, Then uh, the fourth angel... Uh, blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, and they became dark. And one-third of the day was dark, and also one-third of the night. And then I looked, and I heard a single eagle. Uh, many translations say uh, angel. This NLT says eagle. Okay? I, I like to lean towards an angel. Okay? Uh, he says, then I looked, and I heard a single angel 
crying loudly as it flew through the air, terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when this last three angels blow their trumpets. And so here we are at the fourth trumpet. And at this fourth trumpet, what do we have? We have the atmosphere being destroyed, okay? As it already laid down, third of the sun, third of the moon, third of the stars, all that stuff was darkened and everything. But very interesting here, verse number 13, we find that the angel is giving a warning about the upcoming three trumpets. That's what he's doing. Uh, in the New King James, it doesn't, say, it doesn't say terror, terror, terror. It says, whoa, whoa, whoa to the, the, to the inhabitants of the earth, okay? It gives you a little different perspective there. Uh, and so I, I, I actually prefer the, the uh, New King James uh, translation in that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, the phrase, regardless of what Bible translation you read this in, uh, when you get beyond the woes, when you get beyond the terrors, the, the, you know, to the inhabitants of the earth, the idea, there's an idea behind this. The scripture always has amazing things in it. And the idea behind this is, is as the angel is pronouncing and giving these woes before the next three uh, trumpets blast, He's saying to the inhabitants of the earth, literal phrase, here it is, those who live for earth and its things. So if you could interpret it that way, right? If you could, if you could understand it through the paradigm or through the, through the interpreting vein here, if you will, whoa, 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 those of you who live on earth and you're living for the things of the earth. He's specifically calling out people that have rejected Christ and have clung to a world system. Remember, in order to be alive, to, to buy or to sell or to do any of this stuff, right shortly after this, that you have to take the mark of the beast. Whatever that mark is, I don't know. We'll explore it when we get to chapter 13. Uh, but, but just understand that God is giving a warning yet again in the heavenlies. He's using the angels to fly through the atmosphere, okay? And, 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 and he pronounces this to the entire globe. This makes me think of a couple things. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, we find, uh, don't turn there. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just give you a high level on that. We find Moses giving some of his last words. And Jesus says some of the same thing in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. In, in, uh, you know, at the Mount of Temptation there, when he's going through that tempt, tempting time, when Satan is trying to tempt him. And the very first things that, that Jesus says, and Moses also penned it a long time ago, is that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. And the contrast, if we understand it that way, of woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, woe, woe, woe to those that are living on earth and living for the things of this world. He's shaking it, and, and, and yet what Jesus has told us is that don't do that. You're not going to live by the sustenance upon the face of this earth. You can't preserve your life. You need God to do those things. Man needs to live by every word of God, and, and, and the short run of life and the painful experiences that are happening through all of these judgments, again, it's nothing more than God trying to get the attention of a God-rejecting world. He wants to love. He wants to help. But if we will not repent, I should say, if they will not repent, then they will go underneath of the judgment. Wow. And what Jesus gave is that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The whole, the whole picture behind that is for you and I to understand is that Satan wants us to act for ourselves. He wants us to act independent of God. Now think about that in the context of your daily life. Think about how many things that you act for yourself and you try to do it alone. You try to go independent of God. Boy, what do you want me to do? Pray about everything? Uh-huh. Do I have to pray whether I go through this red stoplight or not? Yeah, because you might get hit by a car if you go through a red one. That would be a bad decision. Do I have to pray to go through a, a, a green stoplight? No, just keep proceeding. The light's green, man. If you've got an open door, keep going. Sometimes God puts closed doors in front of us so that we would, we would stop and we would seek him in prayer for a better way, for more understanding. And, and, and the whole thing that Satan wants to set us up for is nothing more than this. He wants us to act independent of God. He wants us to act for ourselves. And when we do that, we find ourselves in a bad way. And these are people in the tribulation period that have rejected God's ways for their whole entire life. And, and, and yet God still wants them to turn in the middle of all of this. Let's close with this simple application. It's, very, it's so simple, it's going to be like one sentence and done.
Would you like to escape the coming wrath? Simple application right here. Would you like to escape the coming wrath? The global season of panic, hunger, and death. Would you like to escape that? There's one simple remedy. Accepting the grace of Jesus Christ and committing your life to him. Jesus told us that we should know the truth, and the truth will set us free, will make us free. The truth about, he didn't give us the truth about uh, thermodynamics. He didn't give us the truth about all these, you know, you know how in the world uh, electric works. He didn't give us all those particular truths, all the details of, you know, scientific facts and the way things work. What he gave us is the things that pertain to life and to godliness. Second Peter tells us this. He gave us the things that pertain to life and to godliness. And for us as a church, maybe I should say for us as a fellowship, and, 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 and I guess that would continue to the church big C, you know, all the churches, is that God wants us to learn of his ways and he wants us to walk with him through all the different seasons of life that you and I navigate through. Very simple. It's nothing more than that. So the challenge to you tonight as Christians that have, that have just gone through a crazy chapter 8 with all these trumpet judgments is nothing more than remembering that our God is alive, that he really wants a relationship with you, and this is a wonderful opportunity to experience his great love during the middle of being in a global pandemic. And even though things are not as normal as they are, you know, if we would roll the clock back six months or more, they, were, they felt a little bit more normal. Hey, this is your new normal for this season. What are you doing with it? If you're waiting for a vaccine, if you're waiting for the storm to pass, if you're just sitting idly on your hands during this moment of time, then you're wasting time. Because there's a lot of work to be done. In fact, Jesus would say, and he would speak about the fields. He says, they're white for harvest, but the laborers are few. And I would like to encourage you to get going. Because people are praying in this fellowship. Lord, we need more workers. Lord, send us more servants and all that stuff. And there's something for every single person in this fellowship to do. Whatever the part is that you play. I mean, uh, I, I could go through a, a list of things. People that are new to this church, you know, they, they, they've already started diving in and wanted to help here and help there and do this and do that. What's the ministry that God has put upon your heart? What does that ministry look like? Are you willing to run with that? Are you responding to the Lord in that? All kinds of questions that you can ask yourself, you know, but, but we don't want you sitting by idly here. God doesn't want you to sit by idly. Yes, we worship while we wait, but we also work for the Lord while we wait as well. And so... Oh, man, I jumped on the scale last night because I was trying to break it. I just kept jumping on it, you know, changing the number. No. <laughs> I weighed 213 pounds. I'm not supposed to weigh that much. And I'm running. I'm still trying to run, but it's so funny how rapidly you can, you can gain weight. Man, I hurt my back uh, uh, just a few days ago, and, and I've, I haven't ran in about four days. And just in four days... I don't know if it's inflammation in my body or what, but my body is like tacked on four extra pounds. It's like, where did that come from? It's so fast. What's the point? Don't be a Christian that just fills up on so many little tidbits of information about your Bible, but never translates it into engagement. You remember what Jesus said? He says, hey man, these guys think they have eternal life because they know the word. Listen, I am the word and they reject me. Have that personal relationship with Jesus. Just understand that. That's all I want you to understand. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link at westminstercalvary.org. We invite you to join us for our regular worship services on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are conveniently located on the northeast corner of Wadsworth Parkway and Church Ranch Boulevard in the Stanley Lake Marketplace Shopping Center. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless. His kingdom within us, a heaven is hidden in our hearts. You're in our hearts. You're in our hearts. Simple.